Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. And thank you so much for, for joining uh, today. I'm Munir Ahmed on behalf of uh, Development Communications Network, DEPCOM Pakistan. And today our uh, uh, topic is uh, IMF Pakistan deal and what could be impact and way forward for Pakistan. And today we have uh, uh, quite uh, well uh, learned uh, economists of Pakistan. Uh, the senior most is uh, Dr. Uh, Tahir, uh, Dr. Parvez Tahir Saab, who has been chairman of uh, Bank of Punjab and uh, formerly also chief economist of Pakistan. He will deliver keynote speech on the uh, technical aspects of IMF Pakistan deal, its policies and way forward as well. Then I would uh, request uh, Dr. Sajid Amin Sahab for uh, uh, his inputs about the policy reforms and uh, what uh, could be the political economy of uh, the IMF Pakistan deal. And uh, as uh, we have uh, come to know, after uh, several days of uh, negotiations between Pakistan government and IMF, that uh, many taxes would be uh, increased. And uh, how this uh, tax regime could be reformed and expanded to get uh, required funds uh, uh, for uh, Pakistan. Uh, and uh, Ali Salman Sahab will help us to know about uh, the tax reforms regime and uh, what Pakistan is thinking of and what it should be. So th that is uh, the agenda of uh, today's webinar. Now I will request uh, Dr. Pravesh Tahir Sahab to take on uh, for his uh, keynote speech. Uh, Dr. Pravesh Sahab, please go ahead. Thank you. Well, gentlemen and ladies, if there are any. Uh, there are some. Uh, what key and what not? The key to the economy has been lost. And the note, that is the dollar note, is out of our reach. That, I think, sums it up. Uh, we have a problem right from our beginning, and we have never tried to solve it. We always thought that help will arrive from somewhere, and if not from anywhere, from heaven. But we now have reached at the end of a tunnel which is closed. We just don't know what is going on and what needs to be done. If 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 we knew our problems, we would have solved it by now. We have ignored that the budget has two sides, expenditure and taxes. We have been chasing taxes, and I think Ali will tell you about that wild goose chase, and we tax the tax. We don't try to reach those who are not in the so-called net. So taxes, taxes, taxes. The news from the uh, meetings with the IMF today is that half a trillion rupees of taxes are in the offering. But we don't have much on the expenditure side. And that is our main problem. The reform, if there have to be any, will be on the expenditure side. Our biggest expense has become debt servicing. But that is just an outcome of our disregard of reforming the other component of our expenditures. You see, after uh, that servicing, if we look at the uh, consolidated uh, uh, budget of the provinces, because we are looking at the overall uh, fiscal deficit, we have a big defense expenditure 
we have a lot of fact in it. We have never thought about it. We have this year a subsidy budget, which is actually more than the defense expenditure. Now, why do we do that? And these subsidies include subsidies to exporters who are not competitive, subsidies to, to, to the big and the powerful, and uh, we have not really uh, looked at our macroeconomic situation, whether we should be doing it or not. Again, we have the 18th Amendment, which clearly defines the federal government. Now, federal government does not need, in my estimation, more than 10 ministries. We today have uh, 60 plus divisions headed by secretaries. And we have ministers and advisors more than that. That is not just the expense on the salaries of these people. Just imagine when we have a division, we need a secretary. We need an additional secretary. We need mm -hmm. joint secretaries. And all these services have their vested interest in it. The centralized civil services stand in the way of implement uh, 18th Amendment. You have to have clear civil service reform. Coming to the tax, but I have always said that FBR does not want to collect taxes. It has been tried and tried and tried. It will be much better to tell them to go home, don't come to the offices, you will get your salaries till you retire. And we just ask the people to pay back themselves. They're already doing it actually. Some 60, 70% of the taxation is in the form of holding taxes. So I'm not uh, very sure why, why should we have FBR. Actually, the place of FBR is not uh, federal government. It is the Council of Common Interest. It should be an independent tax agency, should have its own budget, and its only job should be to collect taxes. Policy should not be uh, uh, its, its uh, domain, and it should collect all taxes, provincial, local, and uh, uh, federal. That is uh, uh, my view. Now, the state of affairs today is that we are going to have uh, a growth rate less than our population growth. And how have we reached here? Well, because we were in a program and some politician thought that, oh, it's about time to, to hang out to give some political handout, so they deviated from the program and tried to spur growth. Now, this is a familiar cycle that we have seen since 1980. That we, you know, we get into a program, we uh, sort of uh, do a few things, not very seriously, and then suddenly we start thinking of uh, of people, as they say, and start spending helter shelter. This is what was done, and this is exactly what the current finance minister also tried to do. So Shokat Karin and uh, this fellow actually have done the same damage uh, to the economy. And what is the way forward? The way forward, you can see that they cannot get together after such a serious terror attack. How will they sort of uh, have a consensus on the economy? 
constitutionally, we do need a government that should have some time to do to implement some serious policies. Uh, the current government also now has reached the point where it, it will not be able to take uh, serious policy action. Thank you. Sir, are you done? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. I have a, a supplementary question. Uh, you said like... Uh, 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 our, uh, our government uh, has been more focused on uh, tax collection than reducing expenditures. Do you think uh, they would be able to do uh, in the coming days as well? Do what? Like uh, to focus more on reducing uh, um, uh, the, the expenditures. And um, meanwhile, also IMF has uh, asked not to cap uh, on imports well, the point is, they're not even discussing expenditures. IMF has proposed tax, there's a fiscal gap. Mm -hmm. Now, technically, IMF is not supposed to tell you how to fill that gap. Mm -hmm. They're telling us because we have never been able to do that. Otherwise, it is our choice as to how we fill that gap. And mm -hmm. we have always tried, and therefore the IMF also proposes uh, cosmetic tax taxation, because that will bring them quick returns. Expenditure cutting uh, takes some time. And of import, well, uh, if you have an export structure which depends on imports, you have to uh, give in there. So, but like uh, so, uh, our Sorry, please uh, uh, continue. No, please ask your question. Uh, but like uh, th this shall not be the mandate of IMF to suggest uh, the kind of reforms that Pakistan shall be uh, 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 making in the coming days. Uh, for example, like as mentioned, like if uh, uh, they stop uh, uh, imports or uh, like uh, imports cost lost of uh, uh, foreign exchange. And uh, the amount of tax is uh, collected on the imports is much less than and much uh, less value of Broksab. Uh, first mandate and second, the priorities or like whatever agenda of Pakistan government shall be. The mandate of the IMF is to implement the Washington consensus. And the main item in that agenda or that mandate is liberalization on the external front. Mm. You have to keep the exchange rate and you have to have just a rational tariff policy and no uh, non-tariff barriers to trade. This is their mandate actually. If you want their program, this has to be done. Okay, uh, thank you. Any other question that uh, um, anyone of you wants to ask Dr. Pravesh Sahab? Uh, gee, as a question, please go ahead. Unmute yourself and ask the question. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that if government of Pakistan accepts all the demands of the IMF, IMF then would the problem will be resolved? My fear is that they will accept all the demands, but will not implement them. That is what mm. has always mm. they, they can get some quick support. They will say yes to everything. And after that, they will start finding excuses. That has been our record. We shouldn't be doing it. We should be clear mm. about what we do and what we cannot do. We should talk straight. Talking straight is not uh, a trait of our politicians. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Now I would uh, uh, request uh, Dr. Uh, Sajid Amin, Sajid Amin Sahab, 
who is a deputy executive director of sustainable development policy institute and economist uh, sir how do you see the current negotiations of uh, pakistan government and the imf and uh, what type of uh, technical aspects they have been discussing for three days and uh, now what uh, policy reforms they are looking for how do you see and how it would benefit or have any impact on pakistan's uh, already uh, damaged economy dr sajid amin sahab Uh, Mujib sir, thank you so much uh, for for uh, inviting me, and it's really very difficult to come, you know, after Pervez Tahir Saab, and that we always uh, learn from, and he has really summed up uh, the the major problems actually in in his uh, keynote. Uh, but I think particularly the last statement coming from his was really uh, the the you can the center of the problem actually, and that we do commit when we are under pressure. Hmm. you know what happens in pakistan that we have a high growth 4 to 5% we go into a balance of payment crisis we reach to imf we uh, commit all the expression of interest whatever we do it letter of intent we do we ever self commit that we will do this we will do this and we will do that and we do it for 3 years and then comes the election or some support from friendly countries and we back up from the commitments that we have done under the political pressures and in the last year it's the election year and we go again on the populist approaches and we really destroy the any gains that we have achieved and this is really uh, very well summed up by uh, pervez tahir saab i think coming uh, I mean, if, if you allow me just three uh, points before i go to your question uh, that are really important coming from uh, pervez saab's uh, mm. keynote i think he is very rightly pointed out that that we have been lacking or we have been behind the curve on expenditure efficiency uh, i mean the the focus has been on the uh, taxes while maybe rightly so uh, but i think the equal focus should have been given to which was not given on expenditure priorities and expenditure efficiencies actually and i think this is where uh, we we need a serious work and he is very rightly pointed out the second point i think that is in the subsidies and this is also some some relevant to your question as well uh, one of the key focus right now in in the discussions and you you can say one of the key challenges uh, energy subsidies actually which are related to circular debt actually uh, and that is uh, the the main uh, point of you you can say the contest uh, between government of pakistan and the imf right now i mean if you go on on four key demands uh, on the technical side or the policy side the number one is let a uh, rupee be determined by the market that has been done rupee is free floating we are having it around 277 a dollar today so that demand is largely met uh, the second was to raise the petrol prices uh, cut the petroleum subsidies down increase the levy on the petrol uh, that too is largely uh, met and the government is also willing most probably to raise another 30 rupees a liter uh, in in maybe uh, next couple of days or ne- next few days at uh doctor sahab i can't hear you i think uh uh doctor plan that pakistan has presented hasn't worked actually and and imf has asked to revise it because the, the plan offered by the government still has around 700 billion subsidies uh, which uh, the fund is asking to cut down almost to half around 300 billion so government is really struggling uh, that how will it adjust the uh, circular debt actually uh, in in this context uh, the rest of the policies i think with again linked to the question that came as a mandate of imf and i think pervez tahir sahab has very rightly said uh, that when we do a letter of intent then we make a commitment we gave a mandate to imf to intervene actually and if i can just link it to kind of a three key messages that that may structure around uh, but before that i think the impact that you highlighted what will be the impact uh, i think there are two extremes that are going in pakistan right now is and one of the stream is that having imf's ninth review successfully completed will solve all our problems i think this is not the case this is just a beginning 
I mean, this is the minimum that Pakistan need to do, and that is the foundation that Pakistan need to build on. I think Pakistan has to work going forward on four uh, key, you can say, the the areas or the strands are simultaneously. The number one is that we are talking that getting IMF program uh, that is most critical at this point of time because our friendly deposits, cash deposits, bilateral support, uh, even multilateral support from ADB, World Bank is really mm-hmm. conditioned on how successfully get IMF. So that is the uh, number one. And I, I think that is the push that government is really feeling. If you see the yesterday's statement of prime minister uh, that we really having a tough time. And I think this commitment, our mm-hmm. willingness to act now on IMF is coming because our historical you know, the helps that come, have been coming from Gulf, uh, from China, uh, they, they are now also asking that do take your reforms, do whatever you have committed with the IMF. So get first IMF on board, and then we will be there to help you. So I think this is really pushing uh, government to, to, to take whatever the IMF is suggesting, actually. And I think we are finding these conditions very tough, like government is finding, because we in the political gimmicks to play politics, we lost the space actually uh, to, to take these reforms gradually. I mean, just imagine in, in back in 2022, April, what happened in February and March, April, we really reversed IMF program actually. I mean, we, when, when we had committed that we will be raising petrol prices along with the global markets, but we, we sort of freeze those prices uh, and reverse those prices actually. And again, if you go uh, again in uh, just some, when this government came, uh, again, the political instability, I think, is the biggest risk at this point of time because it is really pushing government to delay. Uh, it has really delayed much time, actually. Uh, even you, you remember when this government came, it didn't take much needed decision uh, because of the loss of uh, political capital because there was a fear that there may be an election next two to three months. I think a stable government should have taken more uh, clearly and more timely these uh, steps that people are taking right now. So number one, the politics on economy has really hurt us and it's most of it is coming from right now, this time. I mean, this is a history that we do it politics on economy, but most probably this time it is coming more from the political instability and the political uncertainty, which is really delaying the decision-making process. And it is sort of uh, leading to the myopic uh, the kind of decision making by the government. Even if you see the last ninth review, what we did actually, uh, when this new finance minister came, uh, I actually wrote, uh, everybody was writing that what he should do. I actually wrote that what he should not do. And the first recommendation was that don't do politics on IMF, but that was done. The second recommendation was that don't try to fix exchange rate artificially because you cannot hold it with the depleting resources and then rupee will free fall. We did it, and now you see in the last week, we, we had roughly lost rupees 40 uh, per dollar, actually. So this is now that we lost our time. We lost our, and, and yesterday's statement from Prime Minister to me is really an indication of also that we were not prepared for this ninth review, actually. We, we don't have uh, plans to convince IMF. So to me, uh, instead of, I mean, there is a general consensus, uh, and, and I was reading uh, Dr. Parvez Tahir's article today, uh, an unusual consensus, something like title. And that this is a forced consensus now emerging on the IMF. So this is the number one that we need to do. But this will be just a beginning of an overhaul. Getting IMF ninth review will just give us a time to overhaul the system actually that is required. And I think the second is that we have to go for the debt reprofiling or debt restructuring. If we have to really take some fundamental reforms, uh, there is no easy way out of this one. If we, we really wanted to get something sustainable, I mean, we, we have been doing, like like Dr. Pravesh Tahir also mentioned, uh, this is 23rd program most probably. So it means just every third and fourth year we are in the crisis because we go on ad hoc solutions. So we have to go uh, if some, some of sustainable solution on our debt problems uh, because in next three, four, five years, we don't see uh, the growth picking up so high uh, there is a global stagflation, you know, it, it's going to stay uh, there next three, four years. So Pakistan need, uh, so that is the number second that we need to do a reprofiling or whatever you call it, restructuring of the uh, debt. In the immediate short run, 
I think once Pakistan get this IMF program, uh, it gets some time, but then it has to go back to for immediate relief on the rollovers, on the friendly cash deposits, some delayed oil payments. Uh, that needs to be combined. That should be giving you immediate space. Uh, and that is most critical also uh, because IMF program is giving you just dollar, maybe $1 billion or $1.5 billion most probably. But the only reserves that we have around $3 billion actually. So we need some flows coming in and that can come once you have a letter of credit from IMF and you can go to friendly countries. But most important point I think that is missing from uh, the discussions on a macro level is uh, the inflationary pressures that are coming from all these measures and falling on the ultimate consumer. And that I think go back to your question as well, uh, that what government needs to do in this one. I think the biggest loser on all these inefficiencies of our economic system, macroeconomic system on the policy side, are the people of Pakistan actually those who are really having they, they, they are being sort of clutched by the low employment, low income at one side, and history high inflation of around 30% uh, on, on one side, other side. So they have really lost the purchasing power. And this is, I think, whereas one we, we need a very fundamental thinking on expenditures, uh, which Dr. Pravesh Tahisa was also referring. While on side, one side we need to sort of reprioritize our expenditure. Uh, and, but I, I fear that expenditures may further increase. Uh, for example, if we see only two sort of key, key dimensions, the one is uh, we need more targeted subsidies, actually. And this is where I, I, I think I saw was very rightly pointing out uh, that we, we, we need to move beyond blanket subsidies. We need to go to the targeted subsidies. And this is where I think government of Pakistan is lacking any specific plan to convince IMF. Uh, for example, when of IMF was asking that just give subsidies to uh, the energy subsidies to the households uh, which are consuming less than 100 units. Um, I, I, I think all the households, those who are consuming over 200 units are still feeling the heat actually of, of this very high inflation. So government has to have some petrol subsidies, some energy subsidies, food utility subsidies. Uh, they need to be expanded beyond uh, the BISP beneficiaries, because now the people, those who are earning around about 50,000, 60,000, they are really finding it very difficult to uh, e even the find meals, actually, the two-time meals. So government has to work on these three to four uh, dimensions. Uh, I'm sorry, sorry if I'm taking too much time, but I'll just give three uh, key messages before I uh, close. Uh, number one, going forward, government need to understand that politics on economy, politics on reforms, and politics on IMF hurts you. And ultimately, you do whatever you have to do, whatever you have committed with the IMF, but you do it at a greater cost, you, you do it at a higher cost. So avoid any politics on uh, this one. IMF is just a beginning. We should not stop. Government should not stop on IMF. It should continue to work on other options, uh, like we, we mentioned profiling, uh, rollovers, uh, and other things. And to me, the biggest risk will remain uh, the political instability, uh, because this is really pushing uh, government to go for myopic decisions or delayed uh, decisions. And fourth, uh, we, we need equal focus on protecting people uh, from these inflationary pressures uh, coming from these stabilization measures, which are very tough, but much needed. Uh, Pakistan have to have IMF program uh, back on track to earn some space to sit back to think and implement a well designed macroeconomic policy and a social policy to protect people from inflationary uh, pressures. Thank you. I, I remain available for any questions.
मुनीर साहब हमें आपकी आवाज नहीं आ रही शायद आप म्यूटेड है मैंने इसलिए हैंड रेज किया बेसिकली अच्छा मैं ये अर्ज कर रहा था कि यू हैव आल्सो मेंशन अबाउट बेस एंड पाकिस्तान गवर्नमेंट हैज बीन स्पेंडिंग लॉट ऑफ सब्सिडीज यू नो मनी ऑन सब्सिडीज टू द मार्जिनलाइज एंड पुअर डू यू थिंक लाइक इफ वी कंटिन्यू विद द प्रैक्टिस इट वोंट इंक्रीज मोर बर्डन ऑन पाकिस्तान और शैल वी गो फॉर सम ऑल्टरनेट लाइक माइक्रो एंटरप्राइजेस फॉर देम एज मच मनी वी स्पेंड ऑन देम in a year that can uh, like uh, help them uh, uh, you know uh, have their own uh, micro enterprise dr sajid sahab yes please unmute yourself i'm sorry i i, I think i cannot unmute once you you don't allow me to okay. unmute but now okay. it is now it is uh -huh. i think i i have you heard your question what i mean is huh. that pakistan need to cut the blanket subsidies uh -huh. and go towards targeted subsidies <laughs> i think your question on enterprise may be a medium to long term question uh -huh. but pk pakistan need really immediate relief as i mentioned that once once you raise further petrol prices by 30 a later you increase energy prices by 10 to 12 rupees per unit and you let rupee further uh, depreciate which of course is much needed mm. uh, it will bring an inflationary pressure okay. uh, with the growth rate going to a one point i mean around 1% most probably the new revised macro model or macro framework which is showing that growth will be around 1.5% but i really think that it may go even below 1% actually uh, mm -hmm. dr hafiz pasha has mentioned that it can be negative even mm. so mm. pakistan people really need an immediate relief and i think just one point that i would like to add uh, the picture that is missing is uh, we we are talking about federal government but the two other stakeholders uh, need to really come forward and that is the provinces uh, provinces has to really take a lead role uh, in terms of designing these targeted subsidies though in collaboration with the federal government but they should come up with uh, their their programs and proposals to to protect people from these infl inflationary pressures because they have a good social safety net structure social uh, infrastructure structure so number one uh, number two i think the state bank of pakistan has been really failing on delivering low and stable inflation it has not been able to anchor the expectations of the people of inflation expectations so i think it will also be very critical to see uh, while of course this is a medium term uh, agenda but we need to start working on right now if we really have to have slow slowing down the inflation because one of the key factor which is really hurting people now uh, is the inflation and of course it is being driven by some external factors like oil price global oil prices like ukraine war uh, and of course imf's condition uh, but state bank need to gear up uh, to deliver on a low stable inflation so i think it will take three key stakeholders to work together and the one is uh, the the federal government uh, the other is the provincial government and the uh, sort of the state bank of pakistan and i think one again i i, I just close on three key uh, sort of angles are the dimensions on which the government need to work simultaneously to protect people from inflationary pressures of course it's working on macroeconomic stabilization and other things uh, but at the same time we have already talked on the social safety nets mm. i think the administrative measures are really missing at a district level and the tehsil level i i i still think i have been talking to many people those who who work in food mandis food markets those in the grocery wholesale grocery they really think that one of the key portion of price rise is also coming from the over profiteering and the holding mm. because the price control committees are really not working the way they should have done and i think one of the key missing element is the local governments at third tier actually so this is where the role of provinces is very critical to engage with the district management and bring in uh, price control committees actually to curb over profiteering or uh, to minimize these uh, over holdings on the basic food items of the life like vegetables like flour like others uh, so i think uh, we, we need to have a very uh, sort of multi prong agenda uh, okay. but your proposal on enterprise is good for development in medium to long term hmm. uh, but right now it's targeted subsidies which are needed to protect people okay okay thank you very much uh, dr sajid amin sahab and uh, if we have uh, supplementary questions uh, after uh, uh, ali salman sahab's uh, presentation then Well, I will uh, open the floor as well. I know I, I have uh, several questions and uh, hand raised also, but uh, I will come uh, to you, uh, uh, 
uh, after uh, Ali Salman. Ali Salman Saab uh, is uh, the executive director of uh, Prime uh, Institute. Prime uh, basically is the Economic Research Institute, and they have uh, a good insight uh, on uh, uh, whatever uh, policies Pakistan has, and also they are monitoring the IMF uh, uh, Pakistan deal. Uh, Ali Salman Saab, over to you, and how do you see uh, the tax regime that uh, uh, IMF uh, has suggested and uh, what uh, Pakistan's response would be and uh, what uh, would be the implications for the general public? Ali Salman Saab. Ji, thank you so much, uh, Manish Saab. Um, can you hear me, Ji? Yeah, very much. Can you hear me, Manish Saab? Yes, yes, I can all hear right. you. So I would like to, all right, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Um, well, I think uh, uh, after hearing uh, Dr. Pabrez Tahir and Dr. Sajid Amin, uh, including the the, uh, the the viewpoints on the taxation measure, uh, I think these these issues have been comprehensively addressed already, mm -hmm. and I tend to agree with um, most of the points, if uh, all, if not all of the points. Uh, particularly last one, I, I'll, 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 I'll have a disagreement on with Sajid Amin's point of price uh, control, but we'll come back to it later on. Um, so going back to um, you know the the emergence of current crisis first of all, and then then we'll come to the tax measure. It is important to understand um, you know back uh, when we started with the, with the program with the with the Abdul Hafiz Sheikh as uh, finance minister. I think Pakistan had started to do well. Pakistan was on the path of uh, both stabilization and um, recovery. Um, and remember also the, that was the COVID time, uh, but Pakistan economy reasonably uh, was reasonably performing. Um, and we had um, economic activities going on. We had investment coming in, um, let's say in the real estate sector, and there was, I think, a, a significant degree of, um, uh, I would say, e economic dynamism. Uh, but comes uh, Mr. Shaukat Reen, and Mr. Shaukat Reen uh, convinced uh, somehow Imran Khan that uh, we need to have a pro-cyclic measure, which means that when the economy is going, uh, you know, already on, on the reasonable height or positive degree of growth, uh, then we need to actually spend more money. Uh, not only that, but, but also he advised that, uh, you know, let's uh, freeze the petroleum prices, as uh, Dr. Sajid and Dr. Pervesa had also mentioned. And that was really the beginning of the crisis for, for us. Um, we had budgeted about uh, 600 billion rupees overall in subsidies in the previous budget, um, which went up to uh, 1.5 trillion rupees so when we closed the budget. Now comes the next government, uh, Mr. Mifta Ismail. Uh, at that point in time, already uh, you know, government was in fiscal constraint, obviously, and on the back of the growth, uh, the current account deficit, trade deficit was was growing. Uh, but here comes uh, uh, you know Mifta Ismail, and and while he was negotiating with IMF, he also started you know derailing from some of the basic. Uh, I would not say IMF program, but some of the basic, uh, uh, you know, sound economic policies, uh, import import uh, compression was his idea to begin with. And, uh, and that created pressure on the industry because uh, we, 90% uh, of our imports are uh, non-luxury in nature. They are used uh, as raw materials, as uh, products uh, for, for production and for other means. So. Uh, so import compression um, oops, it decreased, uh, of course, the trade deficit a little bit. Um, uh, so it, it achieved the short-term objective, but it created long-term problem uh, for the for the government. And then comes Mr. Dar, and he added on that you know while the import uh, while while the import restrictions were relaxed, um, he brought in his own uh, fixations with with the dollar. So while logistics, while while the imports were still sort of not not fully fully um, open, uh, the central government, uh, the Ministry of Finance, started putting pressure on the state bank um, and on the commercial banks about 
you know the you know the, the, the artificially bringing the 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 dollar down so that creates so whenever this happens it it is you know uh, if you do such kind of artificial controls in commodities uh, imagine sugar once it was we try to actually control the sugar by court orders what happened the sugar went off the up the market it it was no more on the shelf it went into a black market and uh, same thing happened with the dollar when you try to bring artificial control it will um, you know go away from the normal market or the you know start um, we will have start we, we will have multiple rates and that is exactly what happened and and that is the problem which uh, you know even for for the country like Pakistan in which we always are criticizing but by the way we have we had solved this problem for 30 years we did not have this problem of um, you know, multiple rates of dollar or a black market of dollar. We did not have the problem simply. Yes, it was a problem of exchange rate depreciation, but at least the black market was not, was not there. Now, what happened with the black market that in a, in a time when you need more dollar inflow, you're actually discouraging the market uh, to perform normally. You're, you're discouraging people to send in money through a normal banking channel. You're encouraging exporters to stop their export proceeds. You are actually giving signals to all those who are involved in international trade that wait, you know, you don't need to. Uh, let's let's hold on. You will make more money if you don't accept, if you don't receive the dollars into your bank account right now. Let's wait, and that you know that multiplied the crisis exactly at the time when Pakistan needed more uh, dollar inflow. And as rightly mentioned, that um, is in the in the absence of IMF program. Uh, no friendly countries were willing to sort of, um, uh, you know, accept our our request, and that is uh, well, you know, signified that the problem why we were still committed to make our external payments. Now, Pakistani government and in Isagdar in particular was, you know, went on record that we will not uh, we will not change any external debt payments plan, um, and I think that was also a mistake, uh, unrealistic. Um, uh, planning because uh, the we would we simply did not have enough dollar inflow committed at that point while we were making the external payments uh, on time, so it was taken as as a credit, but ultimately it further put our, you know put put us into significant pressure. Now, um, um, uh, obviously, we have this, uh, this. This started from a fiscal crisis. This started the, the, the basic the the. the the origin of this crisis is fiscal, but it went into also the current account uh, problem and the trade uh, account problem as well. Uh, it is very right that now the demand, and now I've come to the uh, you know the taxation issue. Now the demand is, of course, the IMF is saying that okay, uh, we need to create the government of Pakistan need to collect about 600 billion rupees extra uh, revenue over and above what was budgeted. The budgeted is 7.4 trillion rupees. IMF is saying you need to collect 600 billion rupees because of the changed circumstances, because of the high inflation, uh, that is not going to be enough. So you need to collect that. Now, now how government is going to do it, right? So uh, very old traditional measures, they are saying these are tough measures. I think this is just tough on, not on the government, this is tough on the people. For instance, uh, increase GST from already a very high rate, very high rate of 17% to 18%. This is, um, I think, should not, should not be done. And then they are saying uh, that, uh, you know, we will bring GST also on the petroleum uh, products now. Again, this has been uh, this is being considered right now. Increasing the PDL, bringing the GST on petroleum prices will significantly uh, increase the petroleum prices. Um, and then some other measures like uh, you know uh, adding fifty pesa per stick on the cigarette consumption. Uh, so these are the kind of the old ideas which the government is now again uh, trying to sell to IMF that uh, we are ready to plug this hole, this six hundred billion rupees. Uh, gap which the IMF is is uh, has has mentioned, but now come on the other side. Uh, I think that is where I like to uh, connect my thoughts process with with uh, what Dr. Prabhesha has uh, left at, 
and that is the expenditure side. Uh, but before before that, I think we also need to, you know, rather than talking directly expenditure, I like lot like to talk about tax expenditure, and that is the tax exemptions. Now, um, uh, you know, while we are talking about uh, tax collection, uh, we do not often hear talk about tax exemptions. Uh, and by tax exemption, I mean the formal sector, which is already on, on the tax base, uh, close to uh, 1.5 trillion to 2 trillion rupees, in my estimate, are being given up in different kind of tax exemptions on income tax, on uh, custom duty, on sales tax. And a um, large chunk of this uh, tax exemptions, in my view, um, have to be withdrawn. Um, and that can significantly you know, plug that gap um, without putting pressure, without increasing the GST rate. So, so let's, let's see where we already uh, are lacking. So we have introduced too many exemptions. Uh, we, we know that. But the real tough measure would be actually to go on that. So for instance, why we have given exemptions on uh, the businesses run by Army Welfare Trust, right? Um, why we are given exemptions on uh, uh, on, on agriculture, uh, uh, for that matter, uh, which is 20% of our economy. Uh, you know, at least the large uh, tax, large landholders uh, should be brought into the tax space. And uh, this is high time that we discuss this um, this idea, for instance, uh, that you know, let's take this province, let's take the agriculture income tax from the provinces to the federal government. The crises are great opportunities. Now we are. We should not miss out this crisis. I'm happy that we are in this crisis. Um, and in this crisis, I think consensus building is easier uh, while, while we are in, in this crisis. Um, and I hope that IMF does not rescue us really from, uh, from this crisis, which it, it unfortunately always does. Um, so we need to go uh, to this very fundamental um, reforms, uh, taking exemptions away. Uh, subsidies for textiles, subsidies for fertilizer have to be taken back. Um, and, and I think, uh, you know, a large chunk uh, is being spent there. I, I am in favor of the social protection spending. I'm in favor of giving direct, direct income support, uh, which, which is, I think, in terms of data, in terms of the poverty scorecard, uh, it is reasonably established. So we need to make that process more efficient. But again, uh, again, talking about tough measures, uh, why don't we close down the Pakistan steel mill, um, uh, sell the property, and 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 tell those fifteen thousand people who receive salary for not doing anything for the last ten years they are not working, but they're getting salary from supplementary grants from the Economic Coordination Committee meeting. Why we are paying them salary? They are paying salary from taxpayers, you know. They have huge property. Just convert into a real estate investment trust, and just convert that into an income, so that you know those people, even if we don't want to fire them, can get salary till their retirement. Um, we need to bring uh, you know general sales tax rate actually down and ensure that we are uh, we are bringing the retailers into the tax base. Uh, currently, the tax base of general sales tax is very low, and and that is because the tax rate is very high. And it is too, too complex. So we need to move into a single rate um, uh, and single digit um, sales uh, sales tax. We have written a lot about it. Dr. Ikramul Haq, um, you know, has published a, a whole book on, on this, uh, which Prime uh, published. So there is a detail on it, but I'm not into, into those details. So my point is that uh, we, we still have options. Uh, we still have, um, you know, um, avenues to make it, uh, to, to solve the fiscal crisis, but uh, we are following uh, wrong policies. And um, I think IMF is also, uh, you know, just getting into what government is proposing, which has the really the old tricks, uh, creative accounting. Uh, today we learned about the circular debt. Um, I'm sorry, the, there's no more light, but I'll keep talking. Um, yes. Um, so the, the circular circular debt, um, and now the government is saying, okay, we can do some creative accounting for you um, on, you know, they, the ministry will release a supplementary grant to, um, you know, um, OGDC, uh, SNGPL, SSGPL, and then they will issue dividends. This kind of 
gimmickry is going on uh, instead of solving the real problem, which is really the government owned um, uh, electricity and utility companies, uh, which, which again, we have, we have failed to reform, we have failed to privatize, we have failed to restructure. Um, and, and it is still not, I, I don't think so, government has the capacity or the will right now to talk about these matters. So the only strategy the government has is okay, um, save today, and um, we will get a few few billion dollars from friendly countries, and we will probably survive for a couple of months. But even that, I think right now, uh, seems difficult. The numbers are not, not, not looking good, even if the IMF program on, uh, because we have um, built to you know significant amount of um, bad policy ideas um, and continue to stick to them. Um, so we need to change that thing. Oh, okay. I think uh, you are done, uh, Lisa Mansa. Yes, I said. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, uh, all from uh, our. Uh, uh, with the uh, guest speakers. And uh, now uh, I will open the floor for a question and answer. Uh, we also have uh, uh, a guest from uh, Sri Lanka, uh, Dr. Rohanta. Uh, Ro Dr. Rohanta, uh, I unmute you. Whatever uh, uh, the question you have, you can ask to the panelists. And I also unmute uh, Salman Saab, you, Ali Salman, and uh, uh, unmute yourself, uh, Dr. Rohanta. And uh, I also unmute uh, Dr. Pravesh Tahir Sahab. And I also unmute Dr. Sajid Amin Sahab so that uh, the conversation uh, uh, could take quite smoothly. Okay, that's great. Uh, go ahead, uh, Dr. Rohanta. Uh, what uh, questions do I have for, uh, to our uh, panelists? Thank you very much, sir. I think the first question that um, that I would like to ask is uh, Pakistan for reserves for around sixteen billion dollars. I think in twenty twenty two, and then it is right now at about three point one billion. I just want to find out is at which point did Pakistan take a decision that they're going to go, go to IMF, and at that time, what was the foreign reserve cover? Because currently it's at three weeks. Thank you. Okay, uh, you're talking about the first time then uh, 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 Pakistan uh, went to IMF? Uh, this particular round, this time around. Okay. Uh, my, my question is uh, actually, now for example, one of the problems we have in Sri Lanka is that we, we were, uh, I mean, the government was continuously saying that we are not going to go to the IMF and we can have a homegrown solution. But the whole world, together with the private sector, was saying go to the IMF. You know, hmm. uh, so we waited till almost our foreign reserves came down uh, to about two and a half weeks. And uh, then only the whole um, armory got uh, moved on in terms of saying, let's go to IMF. So from last March onwards, uh, this process has gone. And I think, you know, till you have the, uh, uh, the multilateral, that your data is agreeing to the restructuring, IMF doesn't take you on board. So. We are right now in the process of the final phase of, uh, of agreeing on the data. And then, of course, um, you know, you have uh, the IMF, which is coming in. But just like Pakistan, uh, you know, they, it's very hurtful because one is um, the, the, the interest has, uh, has the, or the pay taxes have been increased considerably, which was brought down to about 8% of GDP, is now again taken back to about 16% of GDP. So... Uh, so it's the, the nation is going through pain. Inflation is at about, I mean, Pakistan is good at about 28.5. Our inflation touched almost 80 percent, and now it has been brought down to 60 percent. So there is a lot of social cost involved <coughs> in the restructuring process. But then, more importantly, I think one speaker said this very, very well. He said that it's, uh, it, it's one of the best things that has happened to Pakistan. And I think it's the best thing that has happened to Sri Lanka also, because we have now decided that um, you know, uh, we have to start learning to cut our cloth based on the amount of fabric that is there. So, so now the whole uh, armory of reducing our total um, cost of um, uh, public sector salaries, then all the different subsidies have been re-looked at. We have moved on to target, targeted uh, 
um, subsidies than a blanket like was that was discussed. Uh, and then of course, the state-owned enterprises that are not making a, are making a loss as well as making a profit are going to go on the hammer quite to be privatized. So mm -hmm. I think it's a tipping point for Sri Lanka. And of course, Sri Lanka's economy is small. It's about 75 billion. Uh, so, so, you know, the turnaround will be quicker. So I think it's tipping point, but I was just only just trying to understand was uh, 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 the mistake that we made was that we waited for so long for us to go to IMF, uh, this particular round, uh, mm. but the, that same mistake was made by Pakistan. Okay. Uh, Dr. Pravesh Sahir Sab, uh, uh, can you come closer to the camera and uh, respond to it so that I can, uh, we could also see you. Well, uh, can you see me? Yes, I can. Okay. Well, uh, we made the same mistake. Uh, Asaguma, the finance minister, took a lot of time uh, to go to the IMF in 2019. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, sir. We all hear okay. you. Okay, so we made the same mistake. In fact, we made, uh, although we did not have reserves as bad as Sri Lanka, and we decided to contact the IMF at the right time, but then there was this dickering by the new government in 2019. Finally, they decided, but then they went back on their promises in, in the midst of the program. Now that is al always very serious. The program was stalled and comes the new government. It again starts the program, the MISCA period. But then we have uh, the magician uh, Da, who sort of again violated some of the things agreed with the IMF. So we have probably uh, an equally bad record with the IMF. Uh, and uh, we will, I don't know uh, where, where to begin, but if at all the program is finalized, we will have to do the same thing that Sri Lanka is doing now, restructuring not only of foreign credits, but also of domestic debt, which is our bigger problem. 80% of our debt is domestic. And that has become a very big problem. Uh, Dr. Sajid Amin Saab. Oh, thank you. I, I think this is a very important question, but I have one clarification to Ali Salman Saab, actually, mm -hmm. uh, before I, I touch upon. Uh, I did not ask for controlling prices or price fixation, actually. Uh, price control committees do not fix prices, actually. They just make sure through administrative measure that what is the price determined in the market, uh, sellers, shopkeepers don't overcharge, actually. They, they don't hmm. uh, do over profiteering. So it's not price fixation. And I agree with uh, Salman Saab that we should not go for price fixation. It has already uh, hurt us. Uh, but administrative measures... Okay, are, they have, uh, chain is not disrupted. That is also an administrative thing to do. Yeah, exactly. That, that was the point. That is why the, the, we need to work on two, three things that artificial uh, shortage creating through artificial supply chain disruptions. And these are administrative measures, uh, much needed in an economy like Pakistan, uh, where informal uh, markets are there. And uh, many times people do it for uh, through as artificial shortages. Uh, coming back to the question, I think this was a very important question. Uh, when actually we went to uh, IMF uh, initially, I mean, even the last government of PMLN actually had started thinking uh, in 2017 to go to IMF because the, I, the balance of payment crisis has started setting in actually. Uh, so the decision to go to IMF was done much earlier. And most probably, I, I, I think the, our reserves were around 14 billion to 15 billion, uh, somewhere in the range. Uh, when we uh, went to IMF, actually. And Pravesh Dhar Saab has really highlighted uh, where things went wrong. And this is where we are common with Sri Lanka, that political un uncertainty, political instability, uh, sort of populist decisions, 
uh, going for populism actually uh, had been delaying in between the programs and that's really costing us. But I think there is a fundamental difference on, on the nature of uh, sort of the problem that, that we really having other than this political uh, uncertainty or instability that is the common factor, I think. I think one is that Sri Lanka went to IMF after defaulting. Uh, right. We went before defaulting actually, mm -hmm. uh, and well before uh, even the discussions of default actually, if we have done uh, the successful uh, program. Uh, I think the problem uh, or the nature of the problem with Sri Lanka was more fundamental, uh, more uh, in terms of external account uh, problems. Uh, number one, it was that the, the uh, sort of tourism was a major source of the foreign reserves, uh, and that dried up actually after COVID-19, most probably uh, still recovering, uh, mm. not to the pre-COVID or uh, COVID levels actually. So in, in terms of Pakistan, the problem really started, it's, it's more uh, in, uh, deep-rooted in our growth structure. Whenever we have a growth structure, a growth rate of 4 to 5%, uh, we started a balance of payment class always. And I believe uh, that despite all the measures that we are proposing, uh, if we don't set our growth structures right, uh, no IMF program will be last IMF program. And I think there is a discussion already that do we need to start a conversation on 24th program uh, of IMF if we uh, go successfully on this uh, ninth review, actually. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, any more question? Uh, Sabine Gulsaba, you want to make some comment? Unmute yourself. Sabine Gulsaba. The, uh, Sorry, uh, unmute yourself, please. Sabine Gulsaba, unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Now, I guess I can hear you. We all can hear you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the, you know, uh, for giving me a chance to participate in this um, uh, in this uh, webinar. Um, the ideas I have heard from all the, you know, renowned speakers very well art articulated. I mean, I it's it's extremely, you know, uh, good to hear from these people. I mean. I hope ki, you know someone from the government would take into account all the ideas which you know which have been shared here. So I mean I don't know how how these how these things will you know go up to the government. Okay. Is there any way? I mean, it will will Dr. Sajid will be able to, you know, to go to because he's the director of SDPI, he can go to the government and tell the, you know, the magicians as 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 said by Dr. Parvez, the magician Darsap, I don't know how, how this will go up. Like it may learn it low better, it may share ideas here, it may achieve economy go like sum up kia hai, fiscal, fiscal, kyoper it may achieve sum up kia. I hope ki ye cheese and jay, agi jay, or humlo, okay, which individuals who could jay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. you wanted to make a, a question. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, um, uh, huh. Dr. Pro Dr. Profess, I, I, I want to ask you, uh, we are uh, witnessing so long from decades, uh, PSTP cut is, ma government making PSTP cut uh, ma many, uh, oftenly, regular basis, how it hurts the economy. PSDP okay. cut. You asked a question closest to my heart. Uh, I think we should ask a question to ourselves. Why do we borrow? We borrow so that we do something that will bring in a return flow that will eventually save the uh, flows, right? 
you know why Pakistan borrows? Pakistan borrows to pay for its past. It does not borrow for development anymore. All the money that it borrows is due to the past. So PSG actually is all borrowing, additional borrowing, creating future liabilities. And if you ask me, uh, I would say, well, for one year, we should not, we should have zero PSDP. That will give you 2% of GDP as adjustment and you can move forward. Because why are you borrowing money for, to pay salaries? What, you know, it's not just PSDP now. There is a big primary deficit, which means you're borrowing for your current expenditure also, which does not give you any return. My serious suggestion to the government is to have zero PSDP for the next two years. That will reduce our borrowing. That will fix our fiscal deficit and perhaps support somewhat the current account deficit also. And can I add something here, Munir sir? Uh, please go ahead. No, I totally agree with the Pervez side. Actually, I would, I, you know, I would, I would go for a bit more. I would go for next five years with uh, about nine trillion rupees of uh, throw forward, as we know, uh, created by the PSDP projects. And with, um, uh, actually, uh, I was talking to someone at PI, Iskipa Research, the argument which is coming up is that uh, the PSDP is generating negative return on the capital. Uh, so I totally agree with that. And I think that is something we really need to stop doing. Uh, so PSDP should be stopped for a uh, reasonable time period. And we should actually, I mean, we should not, we cannot stop the projects which are like started from previous years we have to complete, but new projects uh, should not be introduced in, in the PSDP okay. in the budget. Okay. Uh, Dr. Sajid Amin Sahab. I'm saying oh, as mayor, even the ongoing projects should be stopped. That's why I said two years. Okay, okay, okay. And then we'll think about it. Okay, okay. Uh, Dr. Sajid Amin. Thank you. I, I think very interesting uh, comment from Sabine Saiba. Uh, but, but really, uh, let me just tell you that uh, government knows all this, what we are talking about. I mean, there's nothing new, actually. You know, one of the key uh, interesting fact for, for the idea of Pakistan is that uh, neither our problem changes, uh, neither uh, the solutions are new. They are there. Government is much uh, aware of these solutions. What is lacking is the political commitment to implement these ideas, actually. And this is, I think, where the challenge lies. Uh, the interest of the government sometimes is different from the what is uh, the interest of civil society. And finding this balance is the most critical, actually. Uh, just on one point on, on PSDP, I think in, in, in terms of ideally solutions, I do agree. Uh, that, that, of course, and particularly after uh, uh, sort of uh, 18th Amendment, uh, this is provinces who should take lead role in this uh, PSDP uh, designing and implementing these uh, programs. And federal government should cut gradually uh, this PSDP uh, by uh, picking up those unproductive uh, spendings, uh, but while continuing uh, the productive spendings, which can be identified. Uh, which comes under the federal uh, sort of uh, framework. But if, if any other expenditures, those who are post-devolution to the provinces, uh, provincial PSDPs should take a lead role on, on these ones. Thank you. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Uh, pro, uh, okay. Uh, uh, Sabine Gul has uh, thanked you, Dr. Sajid Amin. And uh, there was Ayan Mitra, our uh, Indian journalist, I can't see him at the moment. Oh, I don't know. Uh, but he wants to make some uh, uh, a question or comment. I don't know. Uh, anyone else who like to? Uh, Dr. Rohanta. Please go ahead. 
Thank you, sir. <clears throat> actually, the uh, to be very honest, sir, it's not actually the tourism per se that impacted Sri Lanka's uh, overall uh, situation. Uh, I think one of the speakers mentioned this. It's all about our growth model. You know, mm. it's something that we need to look at. Uh, yesterday, I was, I mean, actually, I'm alumni of Harvard. So yesterday, we were at a group discussion. And one thing that came out was that uh, if you take the developing countries, uh, their GDP to uh, debt to GDP was around 65% about 10 years back. And, um, and now they estimate for the next five years, it's going to be that it's going to move up to about 75 to 80%. So that's a trend that is seen all over the world. So I think it's time that us in developing nations ask ourselves, what should be the model that we need to have mm. for overall development agenda? Uh, so Sri Lanka, for example, after the war in 2009, we went on an infrastructure development agenda of, you know, highways, uh, different kinds of infrastructure that actually led to this whole debt uh, not being sustainable for Sri Lanka. You know, you had, so, so I think we have to relook at our model uh, because if you really look at Sri Lanka in terms of exports and imports, our total import bill at the best of times is about 2 billion. And if you look at our total uh, money that we could earn, we earn about, um, say, about um, 15, 16 billion on exports. We have 7 billion that comes from people who are working abroad. And then um, tourism would give us three that takes us to 26. So 24, 26, we are okay. There's no pressure on the overall uh, dollar. But what has happened is that our overall growth model has not been thought through properly. And that is only what's creating this whole um, uh, challenge that we are currently faced with. And some of them, 50% of the current debt is from ISBs because we went and um, uh, called ourselves uh, uh, the, the, the not a poor nation, but we are in the middle income category. And as soon as that happens, you don't have any funding that comes from um, UN agencies and other multilaterals. And then you go to the, you have to go to the debt market. So then what happens? Your raising money is high. So I think uh, what is important is for us to look at our total development model and then ask ourselves, you know, how do we strike a balance between uh, a political vision uh, and, and people's overall uh, social, um, uh, social, what shall I say, um, social uh, net uh, and social growth uh, that needs to be balanced between the two. Thank you. Okay. 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 Uh, uh, Dr. Sajid Amin Sab, uh, you wanted to respond to some uh, questions? Oh, thank you. No, no, not respond. Actually, it, it ah. was really, I mean, the point coming that it is the growth structure. I, I okay. really highlighted myself as a growth structure fundamental problem. Uh -huh. uh, when I just pointed tourism, it, it was just that uh, while economy was already struggling due to its fundamental uh, sort of uh, weaknesses that, that Dr. Hentha has mentioned, uh, the, the dried up resources, foreign reserves actually uh, pushed it further. Uh, catalyzed the process to decay uh, the process. But I think the last moment just, uh, he has really raised a very good question that what should be the development model actually hmm. uh, going forward? And I think this relates to your question as well that you put on while in, in your introduction remarks hmm. that what needs to be done. I think one lesson that we can learn from COVID-19 is uh, that any sustainable development is not possible if any government does not invest in people that should be the priority number one, investing in the people, social spending, health, education, social protection, skills development, a combination of those, uh, that will be the number two, uh, investments in green transition, actually. I think one of the biggest uh, shock to countries like Sri Lanka and Pakistan are mostly the many time external shocks. They, they catalyze actually your problems further. For example, the global oil prices actually a country uh, where we, we have $26 billion, most probably oil imports last year. I, maybe this, I, I don't remember the exact number, but there's something closer like this one. one. And this really makes our trade balances and current account balances really disturbing. So I think a transition towards green energy, green investments, a green transition, that should be the second component of uh, going forward the development mm -hmm. agenda. And finally, I think the third lesson that we have really learned from COVID-19 is and that is the uh, investing in a forward-looking context in terms of IT, in terms of technologies. So any any countries, those who will be balancing these 
three to four key uh, sort of areas investing in mm. people green transition and in a forward looking manner uh, this will be actually giving some sort of sustainable uh, development uh, recovery uh, from the crisis covid 19 and going forward i think this is what what we call uh, there is a slogan uh, building forward better actually uh, but this is a very fundamental question and i think that needs more deliberation that what should be the model mm. of growth model of development for countries like Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and many others. Thank you. Okay, okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sajid sir. I have a question uh, that uh, if we get uh, uh, good uh, borings um, from uh, IMF and other countries, and who and how it should be ensured that it is invested more rationally, and what could be the mechanism, and who would, uh, sir, uh, this is the question that I received. Uh, Dr. Um, uh, 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 first, uh, Dr. Pravesh Tahir Saab, and then our other panelists can uh, throw light on it. Actually, what you will get now huh. will be spent on paying your debt. Okay. So there will not be nothing to invest. Hmm. What you will get eventually from World Bank and Asian Development Bank and others, you know, the nature of this assistance has changed. Hmm. The assistance these days is soft assistance and the money available is fungible. You know, you give, you give it in the name of education reform. In fact, uh, FBR has spent millions of dollars on its reform. But mm -hmm. actually, these are not projects that give you growth. Gone are the days when you borrowed only for projects. You now borrow for things that, that you know, uh, that aim to change your institutional framework, which should be conducive to growth. But in our context, that doesn't happen. We get the money and we spend it elsewhere. Mm -hmm. That is why we don't have reform. The assistance we got in the name of reform never led to reform. But if you get a project, well, that project will be implemented and it will contribute to growth. So the nature of this lending has changed. And we, we ourselves are not growth oriented. You know, uh, we try to growth. Uh, I call it our political business cycle. Every government in the last year or in the last two years, they want to push it at all costs, even if they don't have money. Before that, they have no growth plans. It's only a question of buying votes and doing something that will quickly bring you political returns. And how, how long we keep on uh, having like uh, investing for the political uh, uh, returns, you know. Uh, 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 who like to ask question or make uh, Manisha, can I respond to one you, point you, uh, here? Please, please Ali Salman sir. Dr. Ahead. Rohanta uh, raised about the, the, the model, uh, the growth model. And I think that is a fundamental one. And probably I think we can, uh, also the program time is all, uh, it's yeah. finishing soon mm. so um so in in my view there are some uh, of course uh, productivity is important that dr sajid Tamin rightly mentioned but uh, ultimately uh, the the foundations of prosperity uh, lies um, within our own people means especially those people who are ready to do uh, investments ready to do businesses um especially domestically. And yes, once if you have a domestic investment coming in in different sectors, then foreign investors would follow. It should not be the other way around. Uh, but how easy is uh, for anyone to do investment in Pakistan? Right? So it's easy to do investment in plots and files, but it's very hard to do investment in, in a you know, real business. So ultimately, the growth model has to be um, making be the, making doing business easier, which also means reducing the tax burden significantly, which also means reducing the footprint of the government, which is um, 
which is huge. Uh, according to a research done by Pied, it is more than 65% government footprint. Um, although in terms of GDP, it is about 20%. So um, we see a significant amount of those restrictions still affecting our business environment. And people are not just ready to take, take those risks. Ultimately, innovation, uh, business, entrepreneurship, uh, these are I mean, these are the fundamentals uh, for growth. Uh, but as uh, Dr. Rohanta mentioned, uh, we had taken the other route. Unfortunately, last 20 years, Pakistan tried both infrastructure development, um, infrastructure uh, you know led growth, which was especially with the uh, CPEC, and also consumption led growth, which was what, what General Musharraf was um, was following a, in early. Uh, 2004 or five. So that is uh, the models which we have tried, but uh, we have not really allowed um, our own people, markets, entrepreneurs mm -hmm. to function, to, to prosper, to create wealth. And, and I think that is the way forward. Ah, okay. Uh, Azar Kresha sir, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Munir sir. Mm -hmm. Actually, my question is to all the honorable speakers that suppose if the national elections are to be held very soon and a popular government takes up the charge, are there any chances for revival of the economy and to get out of the threat of the default? Because this most is... of the people are blaming, most okay. of the experts are claiming that we should allow the uh, national elections so that popular governments could take up the charge and then with the support of the people, they can be able to revive the economy. Uh, okay, who would like to respond it first? Just a uh, quick okay, comment Ali, Ali. from my side. Okay, please go Just ahead. a quick, very quick comment. I, I think the, the problem is that obviously, well, first of all, the elections have to be held on time and we should not make any excuse whatsoever to delay the elections. That's in, in principle true. Hmm. But the signs of uh, whether a populist or popular, that depends what we mean, um, the government is take up the real reforms are not there. If you look at the recent statements by, you know, the most popular leader and uh, his uh, would-be finance team, uh, the signs are not encouraging. I don't think so. They have learned lessons to do any hard, uh, you know, reforms. And um, uh, unless I see changes in those statements, in those policies, uh, I don't see how a new government can actually solve the problem in the long run. Okay, uh, uh, Dr. Sajid Amin Sahib. Ah, yes, you are still here. So, uh, Sajid Amin Sahib, election I, and revival I, of the economy. Yes, I think. I mean, again, I agree with uh, Salman Sahib uh, that uh, if if past is any guide, uh, and even if the recent past is any guide, I think more popular governments go for more populist decisions, and we saw it in the last three, four years, and even the last decade, actually. But I think, of course, one thing that elections can bring is, uh, and that I think will be the contribution of uh, elections at, when they are held in time, as Salman Saab said, they, they actually, a more stable government, which has a five-year horizon, uh, it can take some longer, medium to longer term decisions, actually, uh, which this government, which is really uh, sort of maximum, if we go by October uh, elections, uh, is is the the decision making horizon is very short. It is making uh, decisions by weeks and months, uh, and I think it uh, can increase uh, the elections and a stable government uh, coming uh, can at least uh, sort of increase the horizon of policy decision. But and this is a big but uh, that uh, what if those who are expecting to win these elections do not win? Uh, there can mm. be more instability. Uh, so I, I I think elections can be a sort of a double game, double edged sword. Uh, they they can bring also even more stability. But I think I'll I'll just close with one very uh, sort of pessimistic discussion going on uh, since the last one and a half hour. One thing that I think is uh, happening uh, and a realization is coming. Uh, of course, it will take time to evolve and further uh, getting some ground. Is that it is the economic security which is actually central to your national security. Initially, uh, the, the development, the narrative in, in, in countries like Pakistan has been a security narrative. 
I think gradually this has been shifting towards the development narrative. And if we see, there is now a growing realization that if you don't have an economy, you don't have any politics. Of course, it will take some time, uh, but I think this is good realization as Salman Saab said in uh, his comments that uh, unfortunately we are not allowed to default. Uh, IMF does not let us go uh, a very deep route. Uh, similarly, I think uh, this uh, is a good outcome coming from these crises is uh, that uh, we, we are realizing that economy is at the central. But I'll just last comment, with all macro discussions there, uh, with all long routes to get the growth structures right, immediate right now, the point that we are talking is IMF deal, its impact, it's absolutely inflationary and first priority uh, we should give to protect people from these inflationary pressures while yeah. correcting all the measures that are much needed. Okay. Thank you. Uh, last comment uh, from Dr. Pravesh Tahir. Why you yeah, and you can't see me because I don't have lights and speak on. Uh, well, I firmly believe that political problems have to be solved politically. We have bypassed politics in the past in the name of economics. It didn't work out. It, we couldn't sustain it. So we have to let the political process take its own course, whatever the cost. It is necessary for the long-term sustainability of the country itself. Secondly, all this talk about macroeconomic instability and so on and so forth, well, we have these problems, but just go out. See the informal economy is taking care of the people. They are resilient. They are doing their work, whatever work is available. If it is less, they are trying to do two, two things. I have been traveling, say, as far as Kovac in Balochistan and many remote places. People are not bothered about IMF and macroeconomic framework. Mm -hmm. So we will basically, as a nation, will serve. But having said that, we do need immediately IMF to pay back the creditors. That, that is an immediate liquidity. After that, if there is a political government with a clear tenure, you know, we have to politically convince them mm. that they must take some action. It is the job of the technocrats to sort of convince politicians and not be the government themselves because they themselves cannot enforce what they believe in. It's actually for the politicians. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you so much. Uh, with this, uh, I would uh, like to close the webinar of today. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pravesh Tahir Sahab, uh, Dr. Sajid Amin Sahab, and Ali Salman Saab for your uh, wonderful thoughts. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rohanta, uh, joining us from uh, Sri Lanka. And uh, Ayan Mitra was from, uh, with us from India. Uh, Dr. Khushbu Ejaz and uh, Azra Qureshi Saab and Iftakhar Emma Saab, who is a senior banker. And Fauzia and Dr. Ataula and Sabine Gul Saab for uh, staying with us so long. And with this and uh, uh, next Saturday, I'll, we will be coming up with a new topic and hopefully that would be also more relevant uh, to the current situation uh, of Pakistan. Once again, thank you so much. Have a good weekend.